So I am very pleased to introduce our speaker for this evening, Dr. Carly Olicky, and let me read a little info about her. <clears throat> uh, Carly joined the staff at NPAT in April and, oops, I turned off of my, I, hang on. <laughs> I've got to find my, there we go. So she finished her doctorate at Kansas State University in 2020. She did research on prairie chickens. And um, she, so she's an ornithologist and is very familiar with, with prairies and, and especially how they uh, birds interact with the prairies. She was part of a collaborative effort across state and federal agencies to translocate and monitor lesser prairie chickens in the sand sagebrush prairie of Kansas and Colorado where she gained practical experience in conducting prairie vegetation surveys and managing data and personnel. In addition to her field work, Carly completed a Sunset Zoo Science Communication Fellowship and served as a graduate student advisor to the student chapter of the Wildlife Society, I assume at Kansas State. Um, she's currently learning how to take better wildlife and landscape photos. That's a lifelong project. <laughs> and is very excited to apply her diverse skill sets at NPAT. So Carly, welcome, and we're anxious to hear what you have to say this evening. I'm really excited to be giving a presentation. So I'm going to be covering a little bit of everything, but a little bit of prairie chicken stuff as expected. Let me pull up my PowerPoint. Everybody see that okay? Yes. Awesome. Excellent. Good. And I do have subtitles on. I apologize in advance because it likes coming up with strange words for LEK, L-E-K. So just roll with me. <laughs> so as uh, Suzanne said, I am a relatively new hire for MPAT. I'm the North Texas Director of Outreach and Stewardship. And before I came on to work at MPAT, I first got my bachelor's at Rutgers University, who I'm proudly representing here in the bow tie. And before my accent gives me away, yes, I am originally from New Jersey. Please don't hold that against me. The Garden State is beautiful and awesome in its own way, just like Texas. And while I was there, I also pursued a certification in environmental geomatics. So one of the things I bring to the table at MPAT is the ability to do some spatial statistics as well as producing maps. From there, I went on to pursue my master's at the University of Glasgow in Scotland. And I was really fortunate to uh, be awarded a Fulbright postgraduate scholarship. So I was there as part of an international exchange program. And that was absolutely amazing. And I'm happy to talk about that at some other point in time if anyone is ever curious. And from there, I went on to pursue my PhD at Kansas State University. I was part of the Fish and Wildlife Cooperative Research Unit system which is a federal partnership with universities across the country to do applied research, either for fisheries or for wildlife questions, and particularly to help state agencies uh, perform research and get answers for pressing questions, which is where my work with Lesser Prairie Chickens came in at K-State. And I was also very lucky to be nominated as the outside of wildlife student for my PhD work as well, which I'm very proud of. So I spent most of my academic career working on lek breeding birds. So a lek is an interesting thing. It describes both a social breeding behavior and a specific type of location at the same time. It's one of those words that we've borrowed into English. So it encapsulates a lot. It's describing three or more displaying males that are interactive. So depending on the species that we're talking about, that is either a cooperative interaction where they're working together to put on a display, or it is competitive and they're jockeying for the best spot in the center so they can be seen uh, more easily and occupy the most space. One thing that all life breeding species have in common, whether we're talking birds in the tropics or birds here in tempered grasslands, is they all want areas with vegetation that's gonna show off the best of their stuff, whether it's unique physiological attributes, uh, really unique adaptations to their plumage, 
the way that they move, they're going to use the habitat around them to show themselves off. Another interesting thing about life breeding birds is they don't contribute to parental care. So males display, they look really pretty, they get hopeful that females like them best so they can pass on their genetic contributions to their offspring, but they do not help raise their chicks at all. And even more interesting thing about this system is few males that are displaying reproduce. So it doesn't matter if they're all working together or they're competing. Generally, there's one to maybe two or three males, depending on the size of the group, that are actually going to be successful at reproducing. So females are really picky. So I started my love affair with like reading birds in Ecuador. So not only was I lucky enough to go do my master's work in Scotland, but then I got to do my field work in the Andes of Ecuador, or the foothills of the Andes, rather, low-lying uh, tropical forest. I spent my time chasing around this really cute bird in the right hand corner of the slide, which is a blue crowned mannequin. And they do this really adorable butterfly styled flight for female selection. But the other interesting thing about working on tropical birds is they're long lived and they can do interesting things like push back when they assume that beautiful black and blue crown for several years to wait, try and get a, a better opportunity to reproduce which means there's a lot of adult males that are green and a lot of adult females that are also green. So I spent uh, my master's work putting together statistical models to try and tell the sexes apart in the hand when they're both green. And I spent a lot of time sleeping in a hammock in that little open aired building in the top right corner, which I highly recommend. It was an uh, absolute bath and kind of a wild time. And then from there, I went on to work in Costa Rica on another mannequin species for a little while. This is a white rush mannequin. They are an example of that cooperative life breeding structure. There's multiple males putting on displays, but the only one who's actually going to reproduce is the alpha male, uh, who's actually depicted on that log there on the left-hand side. They do absolutely crazy things, just to talk them up for a second. They do a high-speed canopy dive that is so intense, they have one of the most structurally reinforced are of wing bones in any bird species because they stop up short and basically pop along the log from such a high height and a high speed. And to give you a uh, context for how absolutely wild this is, when I would measure them for weight, I would stick them upside down in a film canister. So incredibly small and incredibly fierce little guys. I spent a lot of time looking at uh, parasite load and the influence that has on display rates when I was working on white ruffs. And through mannequins, I just fell deeply in love with black breeding birds as a whole, as an evolutionary mystery and as a system. I mean, why do they do the things that they do? Why do they look the way that they do? How do they use space and what does this mean? for things like conservation of birds. And I found the union of my uh, interest with like breeding birds and conservation and applied problems of all places in Kansas. So not to talk bad about Kansas, I absolutely love it. It's beautiful uh, prairie country. And it's home to one of my favorite birds of all time. And that is the lesser prairie chicken. Kansas is also a really fun place to work because it's the only place where greater prairie chicken and lesser prairie chicken ranges overlap. So you can see both birds displaying on lex at the same time. Which also gives me this wonderful opportunity to show off how much cooler the lesser prairie chicken is, not that I'm biased in any way, shape, or form. And hopefully by the time I'm done with my little spiel on my PhD work, you'll also agree with me. But for the meantime, I'm going to show you the differences between the two. So this is the sound of a lot of my mornings. The male you see coming in the front is a greater prairie chicken. He's the one with the orange air sac, the darker, thicker stripes, and he's a little bit bigger, thus the name greater. He's also the one making the noises. Now, the smaller chaps running back and forth, rather manic in the background, are less of the prairie chicken. You can see the reddish air sac, they're relatively smaller and they have lighter thinner. 
and I can tell you that despite the, the smaller stature, they absolutely make up for it in personality. I think every single lek I ever watched where I had both species in the same spot, the lesser prairie chickens would push the greater prairie chickens off to the side. So they're incredibly fierce and we're incredibly fun to work with. So the lesser prairie chicken is a grassland obligate. And the reason I emphasize this is because unlike a lot of other birds that folks are more readily familiar with, especially like a lot of the backyard common species, they're non-migratory. They're wholly dependent on prairie year round. They're there through snow, they're there through hail, they're there through the really hot summers. They're really tough uh, birds. And they span four different ecoregions in the Southern Great Plains. The first three on that list are all found in Kansas. So the Sand Sagebrush Prairie, the Shortgrass Prairie and Mixed Grass Prairie. I spent most of my time working between the Shortgrass and Sand Sagebrush Prairie. The Sand Shittery Oak Prairie is of particular interest for us down here in Texas because that is the ecoregion where lesser prairie chickens can be found uh, here. Uh, up in the panhandle over by Lubbock into New Mexico is where we find lesser prairie chickens in Texas. They are somewhat well known in part because they were federally listed under the Endangered Species Act as threatened in 2015 and then delisted in 2016, which is a whole conversation on its own if anyone's interested in, in knowing how all of that happened. But interestingly, this was actually the third attempt to get them listed under the Endangered Species Act. So this has been something that's been ongoing for lesser prairie chickens for some time. And they're currently back in the news quite a bit because they were just proposed for Endangered Species Act consideration again this May. We're still in the middle of that process right now. Uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service is still getting public comments and review. So we'll see how this all plays out in a few months. But what's interesting about this particular ESA listing compared to what has happened in 2015 and 2016 is that they have proposed to list the populations to the north in Kansas, Oklahoma, and Colorado that are found in sand sagebrush, shortgrass, and mixed grass prairie as threatened. But the sanctuary oak prairie birds down here in Texas and New Mexico are proposed to be listed as endangered. So something to keep an eye on for prairie loving folks here in the state of Texas, because it's gonna be interesting to see what happens. And it's also um, pretty understandable to know why the Endangered Species Act listing now four times when you look at the historic range loss that we've seen for lesser prairie chickens. So the figure on the right-hand side of my slide, that really light gray shape, shows the historic range of the species as best we can determine from historical accounts. Anything that is hatched is where the birds can be found currently. And you can see also some of the reasons why they're considering the northern population and the southern population somewhat distinct and not different conservation concerns. Because the birds that are down here in the sanctuary oak in New Mexico and Texas are reproductively isolated. That makes them more at risk, so they're up for endangered species listing consideration because of that. And like with most other prairie species, the loss is due somewhat to urban development, but primarily due to agricultural conversion of prairies to row crops. I'm going to be spending a little bit of time talking about the sand sagebrush prairie. And this is one of my favorite photos that I took during my field work, and also one of the ones I feel is the most heartbreaking at the same time. Because what you're looking at right now on the left hand side is a permanent blind that was installed to watch prairie chickens displaying on the Cimarron National Grasslands in Kansas. And in fact, if you were to look up even to this day, places to go look and watch prairie chickens display, the Cimarron National Grasslands still pops up as one of the number one places to go watch birds display. And that unfortunately is not reality anymore. Uh, at one time in the San Sagebrush Prairie had the greatest density of lesser prairie chickens. Um, talking to folks like my advisor and many other researchers that have worked with prairie chickens for a long time, they would tell us rich stories about walking through the grassland and just popping up prairie chickens everywhere. 
Unfortunately, that's not true anymore. They experienced a 98% population decline starting around the 1980s in this ecoregion just alone. Um, that's what you see in that figure on the right hand side. And that was brought on in part and largely towards the end due to extreme drought and winter storms. So anyone who was in Texas and lived through the drought of 2011 into the subsequent flood of 2015 experienced some of the same conditions that those birds did out in the sand sagebrush prairie. Uh, very hard on the Blessed Prairie chicken population from the Southern Great Plains. But the habitat was still available. And more importantly, the sand sagebrush prairie holds the largest tract of public land in the Lester Prairie Chicken Range. Like most of the Southern Great Plains between Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas, most of the areas these birds are found are in private lands. So having an area where we could release birds on national grasslands is absolutely amazing. So we worked a lot in the command chain from around national grasslands. And out of concern for the dwindling birds that were there, a translocation project was proposed. And that's where I spent all of my field work for Kansas State. So we moved a total of 411 lesser prairie chickens to the Comanche National Grassland in Southeast Colorado, as well as the Cimarron National Grasslands in Southwest Kansas. To give some context to that, this is the largest lesser prairie chicken translocation to date. It's one of the largest translocation efforts of grouse in North America. This was an incredibly large effort between multiple agencies from CPW, the Kansas Department of Wildlife, Parks and Tourism, um, myself and other folks at Kansas State, as well as working with the US Forest Service that oversees the national grasslands. And my typical day working in translocation during trapping would be sitting in a field blind, um, somewhat cold weather in March, catching prairie chickens either in funnel traps or drop nets, bringing them in, processing them, putting some sort of transmitter on them so we could track them. We use both radios and GPSs, putting them in a banker's box, driving them all the way down from shortgrass prairie, essentially in the, the middle of Kansas and then getting to watch them take off that same day in their new home. So it's an incredibly fun project and also an incredibly important management and conservation research project and an evaluation of potential tools for this bird um, who is up for a threatened and endangered species consideration. My doctoral work focused on a couple of different questions. I'm just only going to talk about them briefly because I would like to talk about some other things regarding my current role as well. Um, but the things I was most interested in is why do males lack in some places and not others? And why on earth do prairie chickens do this weird thing where they will display in short cropland, either newly growing wheat or stubble? They're a grassland obligate, and from my experience with mannequins, they should be way pickier about the vegetation that they used to display in. So why do they do this? And what role does female habitat use have in this whole equation? Males want to be seen. Females have a completely different priority as a single parent. They want to stay obscured on their nest and stay safe from predators. So very different ways that they use grasslands. And we're releasing birds in areas where there's very few conspecifics or other lesser prairie chickens there. So what does that mean for the way that they use essentially a novel landscape? And I can distill the core findings of all of these questions into a, a single slide. So what we're looking at here are two different lecks that formed after translocation. There are the two most successful lecks that we had in the entire project on Kansas side. One is what you would expect from a grassland obligate, beautiful grassland scene. The other one is in Milo stubble. Now, the reason why they're selected and they had both a high number of birds from year to year boils down to the same thing. So if we look at that blue line at the bottom of the figure, it's just the trend of it. It is female ability to nest. There's a number of nesting attempts within five kilometers of where we see males displaying. And it, it narrows down all the way down to one kilometer relationships as well. So you get really tight 
relationships between where males are forming lacs, so where they decide to display, and where females are able to nest. The flip side to that too, is that when females are, aren't able to find areas that are good for nesting, they can't find the cover, and they start to abandon areas, we see lacs become unstable and eventually collapse. And unfortunately, it's not just weather issues that both the prairie chicken have to face, but also very limited quality nesting habitat because the way that grasslands are used and the amount of grassland that we have available is limited. So it's not necessarily that lesser prairie chicken males like Milo stubble better than this beautiful grassland. It's actually a reflection of how little quality nesting habitat there is for prairie chickens to use and males just putting themselves close enough to what females need. And this is just one story of many. Um, as many of you probably know, and I'm sure many of you who are in the bird community saw this figure when it first came out in 2019, uh, it is one bird story of many. Grassland birds are leading bird declines. So what this particular publication did was look at the change in bird populations by biome since the 1970s. And grasslands there on the bottom right corner are well past a 40% decline. So prairie chickens are just one species and one example of what's going on in our temperate grasslands. I would like to pause on the silver lining of this figure and that is the wetland there at the top. The reason I want to do that is because it was a concentrated effort of individuals and nonprofits and state and federal organizations coming together to rally behind habitat quality and habitat restoration to save waterfowl that we see wetlands having the exact opposite trend of literally every other biome. So there is hope even in grim stories. And I don't need to tell the folks here that temperate grasslands are the most endangered biome in the world. It's something that many of us know and grapple with every day. But prairies are um, sometimes hard uh, to get folks to rally behind. A lot of folks just see grass and uh, it's a little hard to emotionally connect to that system. So one of the things I wanted to learn how to do with my PhD work was how to pull people in and engage them with not only scientific findings from my research, but get them to understand what's going on outside their door. So in addition to doing my PhD work, I also pursue, pursued a science communication fellowship with the Sunset Zoo. So I learned how to put together activities for families visiting the zoo and give talks to the general public at the local brewery through Science on Tap. You can see my discussion companion, Fabio, also there with me at the brewery. He is a greater prairie chicken stuffed animal only because they do not make lesser prairie chickens, which is a shame. I was also very popular at the zoo when I would do outreach activities because I would dance like a prairie chicken on demand. I would also get children's parents to dance like a prairie chicken on demand, uh, which they all enjoyed because it was an opportunity to embarrass their children. And fun fact, I will still dance like a prairie chicken on demand at any point in time. So just ask, I have zero shame. And now I have the excellent and amazing opportunity of working for MPAT. This is absolutely the combination of my favorite things in a career. So I'm very excited to be working with this organization and. I'm getting to know the groundwork here in Texas since April. In my role, I work actively in all three parts of MPAT's mission, which is the protection, restoration, and appreciation or education of Texas prairies. In my outreach role, I do public speaking. I host bio blitzes and citizen science events. I put together educational activities, and I also am in the process of putting together workshops as we speak. On the stewardship side of things, I do your day-to-day -day management practices, including checking in on properties and conservation easements. I just recently walked a fence line to check it for holes, as an example. I also help coordinate um, other researchers who might be interested in coming out and working on our properties and doing some of the other nuts and bolts, like applying for grants to support MPAS efforts in conservation and management. 
I also am heavily involved in a couple of MPAT projects, in particular Prairie Seekers, which is a Fort Worth favorite, as well as the Prairie National Heritage Certification Program. I also work with MPAT members and volunteers as much as I can. It's really important to me to be available to you all as much as possible and to help support all the different efforts related to prairie conservation, prairie education that you all know and are involved and passionate about throughout North Texas. I also solicit conservation partnerships with other organizations as much as possible and do a lot of networking. I really want a strong conservation network in North Texas. And I have a couple of different personal goals for my role as the North Texas Director of Outreach and Stewardship. And they focus largely on three central concepts. These are things that I think about day to day and what I would like to offer to North Texas in my role. So I think a lot about community action and resiliency, and I'll talk about them all in individual segments. But the main thing I spend most of my time chewing on is how to get people past prairie apathy. As I mentioned before, it's sometimes hard to get people to see past the fact that prairies are more than grass. How do I get people engaged and how do I appeal to their emotions? I spend a lot of time thinking about how to get people not only to understand facts about prairie, but to fall in love with some aspect of it, whether it is an ecosystem function that benefits them or a particular species that they just think is absolutely amazing and fall in love with. I think a lot about what actionable items I can provide to MPAT members to help conserve prairie and to move forward uh, prairie conservation, especially in the North Texas area. And the last one I think a lot about is how can we save prairie, not just for today, but for the climate of tomorrow. The stewardship side of that is a whole conversation and presentation onto itself. But today I'm gonna to be talking about resiliency from the ecosystem services point of view. So I firmly believe community is an important part of my role here at North Texas. And it's in a critical role to prairie conservation. And the reason why I believe that is inherent to environmental conservation and environmental issues are also human rights issues and human connection. And I stand firmly behind the idea that prairie conservation has to be for every Texan or else it's not going to be as successful as we want it to be. The other reason why I focus a lot on community is a, a couple of different aspects. One is that we are currently in one of the loneliest times in human history. Even before the pandemic, uh, three out of five adults reported feeling lonely. And there's a lot of scientific evidence and research that shows that folks that are really lonely have a hard time feeling compassion. And if we're having a hard time feeling compassion, it's going to be really hard to feel compassion and empathy and love and understanding for ecosystems. So it's really important to build that network of folks and make them feel supported so we can also uh, feel compassionate towards ecosystems as well. Another reason why this is important to me is because of sense of place. So sense of place can be defined a couple of different ways. This happens to be the, the definition that I like best. And that is that the meaning, knowledge, and bonds we have with specific places is our sense of place. So if we were in person, I would point out to someone random and ask them to describe to me what they associate with Fort Worth. What's the first thing that comes to mind that makes that a different place from any other place in Texas? What makes you love it so much? What we see in research when we talk about sense of place in urbanized areas, when folks describe what, they, what attributes they give to the places that they live, they're not connected to biophysical aspects. They are not describing the unique plants or animals or ecosystems or even landscapes around them when they're in heavily urbanized environments. So there's a dissociation of sense of place 
in urbanized areas from prairies. The third reason why I think this is a really important place to spend some of my time and energy is environmental work can drain all of your batteries. Climate anxiety is real. It is very taxing. Activist burnout is even more taxing in its own way. And we need all hands and minds on deck. I also believe that prairie conservation is for every Texan. Uh, Natural resources as a field as a whole is predominantly white. When we look at the demographics of Texas, we see a rich diversity of people. And there's lots of ways that people are rich in their identities that we also need to take into account when we think about what prairie conservation means and what it means to have all hands on deck. Another example of that is that one in four of adults in Texas identifies living with a disability. And 4.1% identifies LGBT. And these are all different aspects of identity and human connection that need to feel included in prairie conservation in order to move things forward as much as we can and to have, as I keep saying, all minds and hands on deck, rallying behind conservation of prairies. So I think a lot too about creating inclusive spaces. Um, due to the fact that a lot of our interactions are still virtual, why not lean into them and make them as accessible as possible? So while the subtitles that are below my slides are far from perfect, I blame that in part on my New Jersey accent. <laughs> uh, it is still something that I can do, hopefully to make my talk more accessible to folks um, who maybe can't uh, understand my New Jersey Eve in particular, or just like having subtitles. And another thing I think a lot about too is ways to increase inclusivity and empath as a whole as an organization, and including finding out what things we could do to be more welcoming and accessible to folks. Inviting diverse conservationists, activists, and scientists for speakers is an absolutely fantastic way to start including, get, starting to get all minds and hands on deck. And if possible, either offering an honorarium or a membership to MPAT is also an amazing way to make folks feel welcome and to make them feel recognized for their work. And in particular, I wanna lean on the membership to MPAT as a particularly good idea because we have these amazing minds coming to speak at our chapter meetings. How do we pull them into the activities of our organization and keep them tuned in to what we're doing for prairie conservation? Membership is a way to do that. So I am personally working on making an inclusive media. It is a step-by-step -step process and I'm rolling these things out slowly, but here's some of the things I'm thinking about. Subtitles on all recorded media. That's why I have subtitles below. I wanna produce educational materials in both English and Spanish. I want all text descriptions on all of my photos. I wanna make sure things are not inaccessible to people because they have some sort of difficulty seeing photos or a visual impairment. I wanna make sure everyone is included. Selecting colorblind friendly colors. Um, I tend to forget that there's also yellow-blue colorblindness, so making sure everything is accessible to everyone. And also the selecting readable fonts. This whole PowerPoint is made with a free font that is designed to be the easiest to read as possible. Uh, it's Read X, which is free. And if anyone has questions about it, please ask me. The reason why I do that is because an estimated 70% of the population has trouble with reading. I don't wanna leave anyone who has some sort of interest or potential for deep passion for prairies to be left behind by something as simple as the font I'm using or not including an alt text on an image. I also think a lot about some of the collaborations and partnerships I can develop. Um, all of these are either uh, national with a Texas base or currently based out of Texas. Uh, Birdability is one example of an organization that is based out of Texas. They are a birding group with disabilities that would be fabulous to uh, include in some of our events. 
Similarly, LGBT Outdoors, I believe is based out of Dallas. And we have chapters of Outdoor Afro, Black Outdoors and Latino Outdoors. We're actually gonna be rolling into uh, Hispanic L and Latino Pride Month uh, pretty soon. So that's gonna be really exciting as well. So these are things that I'm thinking about how to get more people engaged. And once I have them engaged, what action items can I give the community in North Texas to help keep Texas a prairie state? And I really wanna lean into the idea that Texas is a prairie state as much as possible. A lot of folks don't realize that two thirds of Texas were estimated to be prairie prior to European settlement. And that within Texas from east to west, we can find tall grass to Chihuahuan Desert. You can literally find all the cool precipitation gradation of plant communities of prairie in Texas, which is absolutely amazing. And there's so much of Texas pride that can be directly related back to prairies. And Texans are very proud of being from Texas. In fact, there's studies that show 70% of people who've been polled to ask whether or not they're proud to be a Texan are incredibly proud of the fact that they're Texans. How can we link that back to not just some of the cultural aspects like the rodeos, but also the natural aspects of the prairie that they have in their state? Prairie Seekers is a project that is near and dear to my heart, as I'm sure it is for the many folks in the Fort Worth audience, considering Fort Worth has put together the curtain protocols and iterations of Prairie Seekers and has done an absolutely fabulous and amazing job. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with what Prairie Seekers is, it is a program that is designed to train volunteers to assess the condition of prairies. In particular, it's also uh, designed to help MPAT identify conservation priorities. One of the things I'm doing in my role is trying to figure out how to take Prairie Seekers and make it a statewide program. So some of the things I'm working on right now are making protocols as accessible as possible, figuring out how to manage data if it is coming from all corners of Texas, and allowing folks with a variety of IED skills to participate in this program. And the reason why I want to include folks at all skill levels of ID is because I think Prairie Seekers could serve as a fabulous gateway to a lifelong love of prairie. There is no way better that I know of to get people to see past the prairie is grass than having them in it and looking around and seeing how much richness there is in even just a small section. So one of the things I would like to do is take it digital. And the reason for that is if you have something that is a fillable form, it uh, can come with step-by-step -step instructions, photo examples, even perhaps uh, you know, video walkthroughs as folks get used to data collection and protocols. Important to this as well is it allows central storage of data and is not dependent on a data entry component. I don't know if anyone has ever worked on a, a research project, but trying to read some folks' handwriting is really hard. <laughs> and also trying to get uh, data entered can be its own hurdle as well, and sometimes slow down uh, processes and decisions. So trying to eliminate that extra step is really important to me as well. And we already have a digital aspect to Prairie Seekers in its current form, which is Prairie Seekers has an INAP project, which is amazing. iNaturalist is super cool. And it also offers opportunities for empaths to come together as a community to help with identification and potentially reduce some of that intimidation factor. So leading into that even more is gonna be great. And I also have some other thoughts on the uh, plant ID uh, starter fear. Uh, particularly with some of the tricky things like grasses. And the first part of that is to lean into some of the things that Fort Worth is already starting to do, which is chapter-centric training, uh, focusing on those core ID skills. So having things like, is we're going to have on October 30th, teaching folks how to, to do and what to look at on plants to determine ID from the field as well as putting together maybe some other resources related to the scenes, such as videos, 
or very simple guides for what to look for in particular regions. What are the key indicator plants for this region of Texas as opposed to some of the other areas? I would also like to build in a pro seeker ambassadors into the statewide program. I want folks to have the wealth of plant knowledge that they do and the absolute love of prairie seekers as a program and the love of prairies to be able to mentor people that are just starting out. I want that knowledge that they have to live on. And I also want uh, the self-perpetuating system of folks able to um, help get newer folks engaged and help them feel comfortable with the program as much as possible. So those are some of my many thoughts regarding Prairie Seekers. And Prairie Seekers does this amazing thing, which is puts us in contact with so many landowners. So that's why I think it's important to simultaneously revive the Prairie Heritage Program at the same, certification program at the same time. So this is straight off the MPAT website. The certification program, uh, excuse me, works basically like this. Um, you, landowners pay a small fee and then they are registered as a native Texas prairie. They get a beautiful sign and a certificate. They're registered. They get recognition and access to the MPAT newsletter as well as access to our resources. The program currently is not very active and it needs some review and some of the landowners need checking in on. But I think it has this amazing other potential. And that is as we go interact with all these landowners and evaluate their properties through Prairie Seekers, as uh, we do that, we get these landowners to register so they can start sharing knowledge, skills, and resources amongst each other and help support each other uh, through conservation and management work. There are many things that prairie restoration and management can be described as. Easy to get started is usually not one of the things you hear. So I wanna be able to support these folks as much as possible and also build in community support as well. And I also wanna use this as a way to increase landowner involvement and participation in MPAD as well. I want to keep these folks engaged with what MPAD does as an organization, and hopefully through that engagement, increase the likelihood that they will want to put their property into conservation easement and keep it protected for years to come. And part of this will also involve updating the restoration and management resources that MPAD has available and keeping that up to date so folks can get cued in to the most recent resources that we have in the state. The other thing that I would really love to see as an action item is something that is already ongoing in a lot of different parts of Texas, particularly down in the Houston area. And that is the idea of getting as much prairie planted in as many places as we can, particularly pocket prairies. And the reason why I want this as an action item in North Texas is because connecting urban areas to prairies is critical. Again, that sense of place is missing that biophysical aspect. And if we wanna build this concept of Texas Prairie Pride, we need priority and more places for people to actually be able to interact with it and understand what it is. The powerful education tool, we've already seen that from the wealth of lovely folks that are rallying behind this in all different parts of Texas. And what I really love particularly about the slogan, if I can, amp up the slogan a little bit, is we can connect what is normally an overlooked ecosystem to one that is a household concept. If we were in a room and I were asked for a show of hands for how many people have heard plant a prairie, save the planet, it's probably gonna be small. But if I ask folks, how many people have heard plant a tree, you're going to save the planet or reduce carbon emissions, I guarantee almost every hand is gonna go up. And similarly, if we hear factoids like the rainforest is the lungs of the earth, again, all the hands are going to go up. These are concepts that we know. We can use that for prairie work as well, because prairies offer incredible ecosystem services. So I really want to steal that plant to tree narrative. It also allows targeted prairie advocacy in urban areas. 
it gives us the opportunity to ask, what if we set aside X piece for native plants? The reason why I bring this up is because there are incredible wealth of places to be doing prairie advocacy. And a lot of places that I can't reach just on my own as staff. Um, that includes city council meetings and counties and getting in on your HOA board or talking to the local and small businesses that you either work closely with or for. Same thing with large corporations and schools or even the places of worship. You, there are wealth of connections within our daily lives that are opportunities to get folks engaged with prairies as well. And Pocket Prairies is a good access point for a lot of those conversations. And the reason why this is important, aside from conserving prairies itself, is also because of resiliency issues and what we're going to need in the future, because we are in a stage of triage and mitigation. So here's the, the real tea about climate change. The Southern Great Plains average annual temperature has already increased by one to two degrees Fahrenheit. In Texas, we feel this most in the winter months as well as in our nighttime temperatures. Uh, they have been particularly toasty for a while. That's only expected to continue to go up. And with that, we're going to see increasing intensity of naturally occurring drought. The Southern Great Plains is already on a drought cycle that's expected to increase in frequency and also severity. And with that also comes increased extreme rainfall events, precipitation events. And what most folks don't realize is that when you have really long prolonged periods of drought, when you get really heavy rainfall events, you get catastrophic flooding. Again, the most recent example of that is 2011 into 2015. Extreme drought, horrible flooding at the very end. And Texas is also gonna get increasingly more rainfall from hurricanes, and increasingly strong hurricanes off the coast. They may or may not hit landfall, but we're still gonna see an incredible amount of rain starting to hit particularly the Eastern coastal parts of Texas all the way on through. And I didn't realize until I started looking into particularities of climate change projections for Texas, that Texas is consistently in the top 10 states affected by extreme events. Uh, this report is a little dated. The fifth annual report is not due to come out until I believe next year. But in 2011, Texas was hit by eight of the nation's top billion dollar disasters. That's insane. And unfortunately, these things are only gonna become increasingly common. This is why I think it's absolutely imperative that we connect as many people to prairies and urban environments so they can understand the importance of prairies to resiliency to climate change and to make it easier for us to conserve the 100 to 200 to 1,000 acre tracts of land in rural environments as well. And part of that is because the population of Texas is projected to grow in some estimates more than 70% in the next 30 years. With that is gonna come increased water demand even though the state itself is going to be increasingly in drought state. And urban and city areas are gonna be hit harder than anyone else by both the heat and the flooding. Uh, many of you are familiar with the concept of urban heat islands where cities are warmer than rural areas. That can get pretty severe, sometimes seven to 12 degrees higher, which if you're already starting off in hundred degrees is incredibly hot. And this is an important place for advocacy because when we talk about protecting humans from flooding and our cities from flooding, we're talking mostly about city council and county level decisions. And some of that can also be small scale of even at the level of HOA. Why are we attached to invasive grass lawns when prairies and natural systems would be much better at protecting us from flooding. This is an area of advocacy for climate change resiliency that prairies are absolutely amazing for. And as I'm sure everybody who's on in on this call, uh, listening to this talk is familiar with, there are many reasons why prairies are important for climate change resiliency. The number one being carbon sequestration, 
Um, NASA actually just released a report about a month ago now saying that the rainforest has reached critical capacity for its ability to store carbon. So the idea that the rainforest are the lungs of the world is not really true anymore. They're not gonna be able to store carbon the way that they used to. And with the expected changes from climate change, like increasing fire rates, prairies are much better at storing carbon than any other ecosystem that we have around us. They store carbon in their root systems. They're absolutely fabulous at them. Branch of prairie saves the planet. They're really good at water filtration, which is gonna be important with the increased drought because that's going to help keep our water supply clean. And again, incredibly important for flooding. You know, the amount of water that prairies can absorb per acre, depending on the type, is absolutely mind boggling when you actually think of it in grand scale. 250,000 gallons of water per acre is a huge amount of water and incredibly important for Texans. Same thing with soil protection. A lot of folks don't realize that we've had conditions similar to those that produced the dust bowls in 1930s several times since then. It's due to changes in soil uh, management practices, particularly things like putting land back into grassland um, that have kept us from having another dust bowl. Pollinators are incredibly important and also an amazing way to get folks hooked because most of them are incredibly photogenic. And you know, we understand the importance of pollinators to our food security in some way, shape, and form. And if folks need numbers, Texas land trusts are estimated to provide one billion in benefits to Texas taxpayers each year. And that includes the work that MPAD does in conserving prairies. There's an incredible amount of value in ecosystem services that prairies in particular are able to provide. So that was a lot of information about some of the things that I think about and that I hope to bring to my role uh, as the North Texas Director of Outreach and Stewardship. So in summary, I think a lot about community, how to emotionally connect people to prairies as much as possible, and how to build a stronger, more inclusive network, how to get every mind and every set of hands that could be passionate about prairie conservation involved. And where to put all of that passion, uh, you know, from prairie seekers getting folks out and, you know, out in grasslands looking at the plant and biodiversity that we have for animals, connecting with landowners and helping us identify areas we need to conserve, to getting those landers, landowners more involved with MPAT, getting them registered as a native prairie heritage site and building a network of support that way to increase the likelihood that conservation efforts are going to continue forward in the future. And hopefully their land will go in conservation easements. Getting folks in urban areas connected to prairies because they need that sense of place to start including biophysical aspects to be emotionally connected to prairies in order to want to save them and fund prairie conservation and other areas for those big tracts of land and rural environments that they may or may not ever be able to get to. And it's also incredibly important to advocate for prairies in every and any small way, whether that's your voting in your local elections or talking to uh, your local place of worship about adding a little pocket prairie. Every little bit helps. And to the resiliency piece, we cannot stop uh, climate change the way it's going right now anytime soon. We can also not stop development, but we can hopefully change some of the norms we see here in Texas and build resiliency through advocating for prairies and pointing out how important prairies are gonna be to maintaining a good quality of life in Texas and maintaining the parts of Texas that Texans are really proud um, to call part of, of their culture and part of their state. And with that, I would be happy and delighted to take any questions and talk about anything and everything. Oh, thank you, Carly. That is so inspiring. Wow, thank you. 